Hmm. North Alabama School for Organizers presents Fireside Chats, intersectional education through interviews with the organizations and people making real change right now. Listen, learn, and organize with NASO and Fireside Chats. Learn. That's what we can learn is you can't do that when the problem arrives because it's too late. You have to start building that sense. You know, community organizing. This school, that's what, that, that's what this is, you know. Uh, I think that it falls in line really, really well with, uh, with Native American philosophy and cultural approach, you know. <laughs> Get people used to thinking about the greater good, not the individual. I'm sorry, so we want to get started with you, Troy? Hey, I'm just here. Ask me a question. Ask me a <laughs> whatever. Yeah, you said last That's night great. you weren't going to prepare for this. You're just going to let it roll. I, I was thinking of picking up kind of where we left off and, and yeah. asking you that we, we got into how the, uh, the aim movement was kind of modeled on the <laughs> the black panthers which was yeah. parallels what i was doing and my question was what do you think and, and you said that you know what a great job the indian organizers were doing right now as far as getting yeah. their community yeah. solid together and i was wondering if you had any insight into that that might be useful to us white organizers <laughs> in our communities <laughs> yeah, I mean, all the stuff that I talked about in the first couple of weeks of that course, the basic cultural stuff, it's just that sense of communal responsibility and the sense of togetherness that society at large in America doesn't have, you know, and Native culture has that because that's just sort of, you know, that's who they are, that's what they do, and that gives them I think a huge advantage when they're trying to uh, when they're, they're they're trying to get behind something or when they're trying to stop something, you know, they are just really good at working together. Even though there's a lot of politics too, uh, Indian politics, uh, and there are different points of view. But when it comes to protecting their community, a lot of times you know they're really good at even <clears throat> setting those different uh, differences of opinion aside. Now, even, even today, I know that, like, for example, out in Oklahoma, you know, where the five tribes were relocated, uh, some of the uh, Cherokees and Creeks and Choctaws and so forth out there, some of them are Democrats and some of them are Republicans. And some of them are conservative and some maybe more progressive. And some of them are traditionalist about their culture and religion, and some are not. But no matter how they feel, I've noticed if their community is threatened or if their resources are threatened that they need as a community, they're really good at all coming together. <coughs> and that's what we can learn. That's what we can learn is you can't do that when the problem arrives because it's too late. You have to start building that sense, you know, community organizing this school. That's what that that's what this is. You know, uh, I think that it falls in line really, really well with uh, with Native American philosophy and cultural approach, you know, <laughs> get people used to thinking about the greater good, not the individual. And the thing that's interesting about Native culture is that despite that, they were also extremely individualistic, you know, uh, to the extent that, you know, Native culture, traditionally, if there was a, a leader, he had no power and authority to make anybody do anything. Everyone could decide. But they were just sort of used to thinking in terms of, you know, like the Cherokee word, gadugi, we're all doing it together. So what, What's that word again? Gadugi. G-A-D-U-G-I, doing it together. Sounds like the, the Ubuntu concept from Africa. 
I think I said that right. I'm not that Which familiar. If, if if I if you know, I can't be happy if everybody's not happy. Basically, right. it's a community spirit. Right, right, exactly. And you know, uh, we just need to learn from that. We need to learn from that. Yeah, it's been a long time since our people experienced any kind of tribal cohesiveness like that. I mean, you might you can go back. 2000 years and find that kind of spirit among the Celts or some of the Germanic tribes, I guess, but it's been a long time since we thought that way, hasn't it? Well, Democrats and Republicans were still going at each other in the 1940s, you know, um, but the war effort in World War II, um, generally speaking, there was a sense of civic responsibility. Uh, around the country, no matter what political party they were aligned with. So I think that we did used to have some of that. We used to have some of that during the Depression. I think that we've lost it. I think that especially over the last 30 years or so, we've lost whatever fragments of it that there were. I, that's my opinion, as there's been so much emphasis on individuality to the extent, I mean, I'm all for the rights of the individual, but to the extent that just even suggesting the greater good of the community is considered crazy somehow in our culture today, you know? And yeah. there are things we can look around us and see people doing like that. If, if people are asked just to make some tiny sacrifice that protect other people, they get up and arm, right. you know? But it didn't used to be that. I think yeah. we can get back yeah. to that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Troy, you're talking about community organizing. Um, you know, I, I think one of the biggest problems that, that we have about organizing with any uh, culture or group of people, and especially the American Indian, is that we need to go where they go. You know, we need to meet them where they are. Exactly. And, and so many times we expect to be met where we're at. Exactly, yeah. And we can't do that because and that no, culture is completely different. Exactly. Something as simple as going where they are by trying to understand their culture. <laughs> yeah. Instead of expecting yeah. them to conform to ours. Yeah, and and most, yeah. you know, don't, don't most tribes or sent Indian, American Indian centers have some type of a uh, public you know, ceremonies that you can go to, like powwows or other other types of, of programs that you can go to to learn. And that's really where you start making. Uh, you start making some strides into, you know, working with them. And, man, can they can they cook some deer up at venison? Oh, that fry <laughs> bread, man, there's nothing like it. Oh, I'm telling you, yeah. But the yeah. thing is that you have to do that with a spirit of humility, Right. Yes. Um, not just like you stomp it in and take it over. Um, so when I was at the University of Illinois in grad school, I had this uh, gig for a couple of years where I was uh, working um, at the university high school in the history department. And it was uh, technically it was a public school, but it's very competitive to get in. They graduated a year early and all this stuff. Um, but we would take a trip every spring on spring break and it was competitive to see who could go but we would take 20 students to clarksdale mississippi and spend a week there uh because a lot of these kids were from privileged backgrounds you know uh, to let them see what yeah. poverty is like to let them see what the delta is like to let them see a part of the world there they would never experience otherwise but on the way down we'd have a talk with them listen you have to have the right attitude, which the attitude is we're here to be at the disposal of the people in this community. We look to them. They tell us what they want us to do to help them and we do it. We're not here to come and tell them how to live their lives or solve their problems like we know more than they do about their own problems, right? And that's the tendency that I think at large our culture tends to have. Uh, and yeah, that could backfire uh, it, when you were trying to uh, 
you know, learn more and interact with native culture. I mean, native people, like any group of people, are appreciate when you come to where they are. But if you come with this attitude of, you know, I'm going to come here for five minutes and then I'm going to tell you how to solve your problems. And also, hey, I'm now just like you. Uh, that's presumptuous. So just being humble, it, it really doesn't take that much. It takes um, advice that I've been given by some of my native friends is, you know, don't force yourself into conversations. You know, wait to be invited to do things. Don't just barge in and do all the talking. And I think that we tend to do that with other groups too, you know? Uh, so if you can get that down, the way I look at it, it's like, um, well, the, um, I don't know if we talked about this or not, but the Lakota word for white people. I don't think I got around to that. Uh, the Lakota word for white people is washichu. And it doesn't literally mean white people. It literally means grabs the fat. <laughs> Implying it's like a guest who comes into your teepee and etiquette dictates that as the guest, they're supposed to take the, uh, you know, the least desirable thing. And then you're supposed to say, oh, no, take the best. And they say, oh, no, no, right? A white person is the kind of person that just comes in and just grabs the best and just leaves with it like they have the right to do yeah. so. Um, yeah. the, the Lakota word for black people is washichu sapa, which means black grabs the fat. Uh, so it's all a cultural thing, not a racial <laughs> thing. Um, but I kind of look at it like, if somebody, okay, so if there's someone you don't know that well, they're not family or anything, they're not your best friend, but there's someone you know, and they invite you into their house, you don't just go open up the refrigerator and go prowling through it, right? At least, I, I mean, I was taught that you, uh, you wait until something is offered. And that's kind of how it works just with cultural stuff, I think, with Native American sure. and any, any group, really, you know, uh, is you, you don't just barge in. But, but on the other hand, I mean, going in there and showing a willingness to learn and a desire to learn, a humble desire, uh, can go a long, long way. Uh, when I was uh, out of high school, a couple of years after high school, I actually did volunteer work with uh, Haitian immigrants. This is back in the 80s after the uh, Duvalier revolutions in Haiti when there was a big wave of, of immigrants. And I had taken three years of French in high school, uh, which turned out not to be that helpful. Um, but after like living it and working with those folks <clears throat> for, for two years, I, I got to, to where I could communicate. Um, but what I noticed was just the very, just the very fact of a white American coming to them, trying to speak their language. You know, like they, they spoke Haitian Creole uh, too, which is a little bit different from French, but just coming there, trying, making mistakes, but wanting to help. They were very, very um, appreciative of, of that fact. And they were remarkably, incredibly kind people. But I don't know that they would have been that kind, you know, if I had just sort of like barged. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. that's it's what cool. we need more of yeah. is is that sort of, of open and sincere and yet not privileged ways of approaching different groups of people. I think that's how you get people to work together. This is similar to what mm -hmm. Beth Howard said in a fireside chat a few weeks ago about. Oh, yeah community organizing, she said, you know, uh, most people listen to respond and you need to shut your mouth and, and listen to learn. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. 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 I had a, I had an American Indian tell me that he said, while well, the white man, white man came first and took everything we had, then the anthropologist came in and took the rest of our dignity, mm -hmm. you know, oh, studying yeah. them and, you know, trying to change their culture even again. Yeah. You know, even the term Native American, a lot of, you know, 
a lot of indigenous people yeah. prefer American Indian just because that came from anthropologists. Yes. Uh, they didn't ask for it. Oh, yeah. fine. Deloria has got all kinds of things to say. Yeah. All kinds of things to say uh, about anthropologists. Interesting. Yeah. In a very witty way. Right. Yeah. I've read some of that. He said that if Columbus had had an anthropologist with him, he'd still be sailing around looking for India. <laughs> ain't, that, ain't that the truth? You know, <laughs> I was, uh, when I was in Resurrection City, a poor people's campaign in Washington, mm -hmm. uh, we were sitting around the campfire and, and there was uh, uh, Native Americans with us and uh, there's some, you know, some other members came in from other other tribes around the country and and uh, they were talking about, you know, percentage of blood, you know, uh, mm -hmm. what would make you an American Indian. And I said, well, what if I say I'm half uh, Native American? He said, well, half of you can stay and the rest of you's got to go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, and how we treated, you know, it's just atrocious. Well, everybody knows how we treated, you know, how we treated these people. But obviously, from you know, from your class, you're talking about how they don't see race or they don't see color or whatever, but we do, yeah. and, and we make that our enemy. Yeah. You know? Now we're still treating them. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And the, the sad thing is everyone knows how atrocious we treated them. But the more you learn about it, the more atrocious you discover it was. Even yes. Even you thought. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think uh, one of the most interesting things that you taught, too, in this class, and by the way, it's an exceptional class. I wish everybody would have taken it, um, uh, was gender. You know, and, and the way that everybody's struggling with gender. And I, I just saw where the Pope today uh, just, I don't know, came out fours same-sex marriages wow you know so that's going to be a, an interesting term you know turn that mm -hmm. that everybody's going to have to struggle with now but yeah you know, hell the native americans they always had it Way they had it down they didn't have to worry about ahead. it yeah you know and there are lots anything, more you know? if yeah. anything in some cases because of the american government trying to force them to change their values um put some of them on a backward path that it took them you know, before it came to stuff like that you know because i think yeah. i did i tell you the story about the uh, crow reservation uh, when they had the uh the the transgender person on there that the reservation uh, officials didn't like i i guess i, I, I guess so you said that the families yeah. took turns hiding them yeah, from the yeah, yeah. indian agents yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, because I mean the, the the crow chief was so offended that these reservation agents would even make an issue out of it. He chased him off to start with. Yeah, pretty amazing. Oh, yeah. I just think there are so many ways, and I I said this I think over and over again in those uh, those classes. So many ways that American Indian thinking was more complex than European thinking. Yeah. Yes. Certainly more humanistic. Yeah. Yeah. Is, um, is, do we still have the Bureau of Indian Operating? Um, it's, uh, I think they changed the name of it. I think it's the department. Uh, it's part of the Interior Department. I don't think they call it Bureau of Indian Affairs, if mm -hmm. I'm or maybe I'm, maybe what I'm thinking is they no longer call the uh, person at the top of it, the commissioner of Indian affairs. That's what it is. That was the term yeah. for a long time, but yeah, they still have it. Uh, and in fact, I'm not even sure who's in there now, but from, I think in 1968, they got an American Indian as commissioner of uh, that bureau. And it was the first time in a hundred years, uh, Back in the 1860s, U.S. Grant had put uh, a, an Indian, uh, an Iroquois Indian who had been a Union general in charge of it. But since 1968, there's always been an indigenous person at the head of that uh, organization until the current presidential administration, which they were going to put in somebody there initially that wasn't native, 
and then that that fell through and I think they put in somebody else and they left and I think it may be one of those things that never got filled I'm not sure uh, so I'm not really it's, it seems to be kind of up in the air under this administration yeah. you know 50 years it was always yeah I know uh, back in the 60s uh, you know 68 69 70 uh, when the young patriots were working with we, we worked with AIM some, uh, but mostly we worked with a group called the Native American Committee, which was, you know, pretty much local. Mm -hmm. And and uh, they were always, uh, always battling the Bureau of Indian yeah. Affairs. Yeah. And, um, and we also helped them, you know, through the, um, with the Rainbow Coalition, took over some land there in, in vacant lots there in Chicago and built an Indian village. Oh, wow. And uh, I want to learn more about that. Yeah. And um, it was it was there for about a month or so, as I remember, maybe two uh, before, you know, uh, they, they kicked everybody out and destroyed it. But it was uh, it, it was then again, something that the press didn't didn't uh, sensationalized because Mayor Daly didn't want it to be. Yeah. And he, he controlled, he controlled the press. So, you know, of course the underground papers and all that radical papers were all covering it, but, uh, it was almost like they were, they were non-existing, you know, I mean, they just weren't there at all. And, uh, you know, when it came to the media, you know, it's like you were talking about, uh, you know, some of those recent, more recent uh, struggles with the pipeline, but it wasn't there until, there's no media there until the pipeline got there. Yeah. You know, and so uh, I think they just, anyway, uh, you know, eventually the cops came in and moved them out and that, you know, that was it. And, uh, and also put a lot of pressure on the American Indian Center that was in Uptown also. Um, but, you know, the thing about the American Indian is, is, is they'll, they have a different commitment to friendship that I, I've known of. Uh, if you're friends with them, you're friends and they will literally do anything for you, you know? Uh, and I also see that with the culture with the American Indians. I never saw a homeless American Indian child in Uptown. There just weren't any. Uh, and, uh, they were, they were all, the children were always taken care of by by the Amer uh, I keep saying American Indian, Native Americans. Yeah, that American and, Indian is is fine. Yeah, um, by most of the people. So I, I yeah. use them both interchangeably. Yeah, but you know they were they they always took care of family. You know um, that I could see. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of struggles, though, a lot of, you know, there, there's still a lot of struggles, struggles, uh, inward fighting like everybody else. But when it came right down to it, they were pretty well um, uh, in solidarity with each other. Yeah. But if you were, you were in solidarity with them, then you were, you were. I locked up, didn't he? Yeah. We lost time. The, uh, the first time I went to a powwow, the guy who was kind of showing me around was, you know, running. He, he kept running into people he knew, right, and introducing me. This is my aunt, so-and-so. This is my grandmother. This is my cousin. This is my uncle. This is my aunt. And it was only after he had introduced me to four or five grandmothers that I understood they weren't literally his aunts and uncles and grandmothers, but that anybody that was an elder that you knew and had a relationship with, you know, if they were much older, they were your, uh, referred to as grandfather, grandmother, or aunt and uncle or a brother, you know, call each other brother and sister. And it's that feeling of, you know, of kinship of, of, uh, extended adopted family you know and you, you yeah you still see that you still see that a lot 
So I'm excited about our three guest speakers for the final installment of our class next week. Uh, I think you're really going to enjoy talking to all three of them. Um, I told each one they had about like 10 minutes to just sort of tell a little about themselves and their activism and what they do and then just open it up for questions and discussion. But they are some really awesome people all from Middle Tennessee. And uh, just more, more proof that, you know, the native community, even in places where there's not a reservation, there is a native community. Uh, and our st a strong, strong sense of community among, among them. Well, while we're waiting for hi, any other questions or anything? Because boy, I had to skip over a whole lot. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, st I'm still, well, the whole, the whole situation of treaties and all this legal stuff is, it's kind of hard to get your mind around how screwed up all that stuff is, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Uh, so uh, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of dense reading, but some of the best stuff that I have seen about the precarious situation of American Indians under the law are by a guy named uh, Robert F. Williams Jr., who is a Lumbee Indian from North Carolina and a lawyer. Um, he wrote a book called The American Indian in Western Legal Thought that is just superb so far as like tracing out the history of all this legal stuff and how it got to be the way it is. And he wrote a book called Like a Loaded Weapon, in which uh, at that time he was, uh, when that book came out, it was about the, uh, the Rehnquist uh, court and a lot of the stuff they had done in the 90s that had sort of eaten away at some of the gains mm -hmm. that people had made. But essentially the whole idea, I think I mentioned in that last class about Congress having plenary power. That means they can do whatever they want to because all the constitution says is Congress deals with Indians. So they can, you know, they can take it back. They can do whatever they want as long as they've got the votes in Congress. And that's the, uh, basically the concept of the book. It's like a loaded weapon pointed at Indians could go off any time. And that's how it always is. I just saw a Facebook post. I think it was only yesterday or it, like the last <laughs> two days that the Smithsonian has, has opened up access to several hundred digitized copies of Indian treaties. I, I think it was a Smithsonian. At any rate, that you know, they've got all these treaties sitting around in a vault somewhere, yeah, uh, on parchment or whatever, and they're mostly stuff that you know you couldn't allow people to handle or actually look at. Yeah, and I've seen some of the stuff under glass. Well, they've apparently. The digitized a whole bunch of that stuff that you could actually go and look at the treaties for what they're worth, which apparently is not much. <laughs> uh, but, but that's, that would be really interesting if I had time, which I don't right now to look at all that, but if that's, that's pretty cool. I mean, they, there's a picture of all these, you know, old looking pieces of paper with a bunch of red seals down at the bottom of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, what you can do, thing reading. There is a volume. Let's see, uh, it's I've always just heard it referred to as Kapler. As Kapler was the editor, um, from um, Charles Joseph Kapler, Indian Affairs, Laws and Treaties. Yeah, they got a digital collection. Uh, but there's a there's a book form that has the print version of every single treaty. Oh, wow. So you can get that. You can access that through a library. And it may be did that, that whole thing may be digitized and online. Um, but yeah, you can look at the wording of every single treaty. Um, the first one in 1776 with the Delaware tribe, when the new U.S. government was trying to get them as allies against the British, all the way up to uh, the early 1870s when, like I discussed uh, in class, they stopped making any more treaties. 
That was 1872. They said no more treaties. No more treaties because, well, the thing is, that was right as that whole process of the Transcontinental Railroad leading to the subjugation of all those tribes out west. Before that, they made treaties because the tribes were powerful enough to have leverage. So essentially, the U.S. government made treaties because they had to. And when they reached the point that they realized they didn't actually have to anymore, they didn't. And plus, by that point, so many of them had been made and broken. It must have been tremendously confusing to try to figure out. Yeah. <clears throat> Almost always broken by one particular side. <clears throat> Well, duh. Yeah. The, the side that wanted the gold in most cases, right? Yep. Or many. No, yeah. just a piece of paper for one side, you know. Oh, there is um there were several individuals. Oh, we can go all the way back to uh Dragging Canoe, uh the Cherokee leader of the uh Chickamaugas back in the seventeen hundreds. Uh, dragging canoe when in 1776, the Cherokee people surrendered and they made it, they gave up some land, you know. Dragon Canoe said, then there's no point giving them land because what will happen is we'll give them land. They said, you can keep this land, then they'll take that land, but they'll let us keep this other little bit, but then they'll take that. But then one day they'll say, we'll give you more land somewhere else and we'll go there and then they'll come take that. Well, he was smart. You can probably Google and find his speech. It's amazing. Like 50, 60 years ahead of time, exactly what happened. He saw what was coming. Can't trust him. No. And this whole, uh, I think we talked a little bit. Did we talk here about the uh, issue of the Supreme Court case? I think that's somewhere else. The Supreme Court case recently in in Oklahoma. Oh, the, a recent one? Yeah. I don't think we talked about a recent Supreme oh, Court case. Oh, all right. Oh, man, I got to tell you about this. So, I did talk about uh, yesterday at the, the class, I talked about the Dawes Act, right, and how that they were going to yeah. Americanize the Indians and divide everything up into lots. And at first, the five civilized tribes were excluded from that because they were already civilized. But more and more white people that moved into the area saw how nice their land was and, you know, put pressure on their own Congress people so that five years later they were added. Right. And so then they got allotted as well. And their governments were discorporated. And then Oklahoma became a state. All right. Well, a few years ago, there was a murder in eastern Oklahoma. I think, yeah, one Creek Indian killed another Creek Indian. And um, I think it was uh, an argument uh, over uh, one of them was seeing the other one's girlfriend or something. Uh, but uh, it was a gruesome murder. But he murdered this, this guy. And so they were trying to figure out. They put him on trial. And his defense lawyers were trying to figure out if it was on the reservation or not. So who owned the land where the murder happened? Because state governments have no jurisdiction over things that happen in Indian country, but federal government does. So it's important to know, right? So who owns the land? And so his lawyers started tracing back the deeds. And they discovered that back in 1898, when the five civilized tribes had their governments abolished and everything, and their reservations closed, and made open for settlement and all. Congress never got around to voting on it. They just did it. And somehow it got lost in the shuffle. They had to vote on it. So the argument is that therefore potentially the entire eastern half of Oklahoma is an Indian reservation. And this came before the Supreme Court last year. 
and they couldn't make a decision. They wanted more information, so they rolled it over for a year. And they made the decision, um, and I think it was released in June, and they sided with the Indians. The, the law says, technically, it's all still a reservation. So that's now wide open as to what that's going to mean. Uh, some, uh, I think the, uh, the, the tribal governor of the Creek Nation has assured the state of Oklahoma they're not going to push it. And some of my friends, some of my Creek friends got really upset about that. But that still doesn't change the Supreme Court precedent. What that could potentially mean is that um, any, uh, any Indian from those five tribes that commits a crime in eastern Oklahoma Oklahoma state or the county authorities will have no jurisdiction over them. It have to be federal. Uh, what it could potentially mean is that they couldn't be charged state income tax or pay any state taxes or sales tax. And if they did, it would go to the tribal governments, not the state. So that's a whole huge, huge potential. Personally, <coughs> I knew that was the right decision based on the law, but I still didn't expect the court to make it. I expected the court to, to, to say, well, it would be too complicated and it's been too long because sometimes they've done stuff like that. Oddly enough, what made the uh, sort of the, the fifth vote was Neil Gorsuch, who is extremely conservative, right? But, but, has a strong history of siding with Native Americans on issues of sovereignty. And so he sided with them on this, along with the, uh, the other four liberal justices, and they won that case. It remains to be seen what that's going to mean, but that is a precedent there in Oklahoma. And that's a big, big victory, a big, big unexpected victory. It just changes, you know, potentially everything. Yeah. Because you know what? Not that likely that you're going to get a majority uh, of Congress willing to say we're taking land away from Indians under our present environment. Not, not unthinkable. But I, think, I don't think it's likely that they could muster uh, the type of majority they would need to do that. So that's what it would take, an act of Congress. Are there any uh, an act of con oh sorry? I I just want to know if there's any land grants for American Indians these days. Uh, under the current administration. Well, without getting political, the current administration is the most unfriendly to Indians of, of any in living memory. Yeah. I doubt that there's too much at all. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they've had a lot of stuff rolled back on them in the last three, four years. When you say an act of Congress, you're talking about to 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 make Eastern Oklahoma not an Indian reservation would take an act of Congress. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's another smaller example up in Wyoming of this. Uh, this town that sprung up, you know, back in the uh, Wild West days, <clears throat> just outside of this reservation. I don't remember which reservation it was, but it was just outside the reservation. And then a few years ago, uh, when they were just looking at the, uh, the old surveys, they realized that the survey lines of the, the reservation had been marked wrong and it extended farther than they thought. And that town is actually in the reservation. So what that means is that, uh, well, there's no jurisdiction over non-Indians so far as like crimes and stuff. But you know, my, uh, my wife, when, when I first met her, she had been living on the uh, Fond du Lac reservation in Minnesota for 20 years she had bought a farm there that was one of those little patches of land that had been lost after the Dawes Act when someone had sold, some Indian had sold it. 
And so she had bought that land. So she lived on on the reservation. I'd go to visit her, and it's like you know, all the police cars are tribal police. You know, all the traffic tickets are going to be by the tribal police. I, I um, I have a friend. I probably since this is being recorded, I won't mention what tribe or where it is, but I have a friend who is a judge on a reservation, who was telling me that. Um, that they decided to lower the drinking age on the reservation, which they can do because that's not a federal law, that's state law. Uh, they lowered the drinking age to 18, knowing that when they did, all the white teenagers, remember who are around, were going to come there to drink, right? And sell a lot of beer. <laughs> well, and set up speed traps on the way out of town to pull them over, right? Uh, for, for drunk driving. Uh, and um, when they would do that, they would explain to these kids, you need to call your parents, you know, because we have no jurisdiction over you, but we can't just let you go. County can't do anything. State can't do anything. We're going to have to call the federal government unless this is settled by, I don't know, signing over your car to us. Oh. The tribal police has sports cars, uh-huh. which is, you know, <laughs> on the one hand, sounds a little, you know, sounds very sneaky, but uh, it's a little payback, you know. Really, talk about grabbing the fat. <laughs> yeah, this is like Robin Hood, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Wow. But you know. Um, so far as this recent case, good news, uh, happy verdicts have been harder to come by in, in recent years. Now, for a long time, golly gee, for like a hundred years, the Supreme Court was the last place where Indians had much protection of the three branches of government from about the 1890s all the way up to the 1980s. And then when times were really hard during termination in the 50s, when the executive and legislative branch were basically trying to discorporate all tribes. The Supreme Court was still ruling um, in favor of tribes and the upholding of the, uh, the treaties that had been made with them. But, you know, then starting in the 1980s, it started to go back the other way a little bit, uh, especially into the 90s. And now it's kind of iffy. What could happen? Hmm. But it is a very, it's a very tenuous situation, and it really shows how how smart, I think, those southern tribes were. Back in the early early 1800s, after they had not been able to succeed in defending their land by war, they were defeated by the U.S. because they were just overpowering. And so they shifted gears, you know, and they started educating their kids using tribal money to send them to college and make them lawyers. Uh, and a lot of times in class, at the beginning of the semester, if it's an American Indian Studies class, I'll ask students, name me some famous Indians. And then they'll name a bunch. And it's usually, you know, it's usually warriors like uh, Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull and, and so forth, or um, helpful Indians that were helpful to the Europeans like uh, uh, Squanto, Pocahontas, Sacagawea. Uh, that's probably about the extent of it. And then a lot of like war figures. And I, I point out to them then, okay, so now everyone we remember are the ones who were physically fighting and all of them ultimately lost. But all the victories that American Indians have had in the last 200 years have been in the courtroom. So, I mean, it's a, it was a brilliant move to make and they continue, I think, to be brilliant at it. I mean, the whole Standing Rock thing, it's still, it's been, it's still tied up in court. Um, the, the pipeline was pushed through, but there's still cases pending about it. 
and like I was uh, like I was saying about the uh, about aim and the various things they did, um, they succeeded in getting their message out there, you know, uh, so that there was public support, which meant political pressure on politicians, which I know uh, from my limited experience being involved in um, United Campus Workers uh, here in Tennessee. I've been very active in that and in the uh, American Association of University Professors. Um, it's the same kind of thing, you know, you have to, uh, you have to get the message out there. Uh, you have to get the message out there. You have to get the media involved if you can, whatever it takes, demonstrations, actions, direct action to make people aware of what's happening and get, get public support to shift because that's where political support comes from. It does. Uh, what about the casinos? You know, uh, the, there's a lot of uh, American Indian casinos around. Does, yeah. does that help the reservations? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so that started in the late 1980s. Uh, the first tribe that had a legal case about it were the Seminoles, not from a casino, but from a bingo game. Uh, they were running for money. Uh, and then the, uh, the state of Florida shut them down because the gambling was illegal. And they were able to go all the way to the Supreme Court to say that the state has no authority over them. That's what it ultimately comes down to, right? State laws about gambling don't apply to Indian reservations. So, yes, uh, the problem is, well, there's two problems. One problem is it depends on where the reservation is. So if you've got like a, res you know, uh, up in uh, North Dakota somewhere that's off the beaten path, you know, that isn't near any major urban centers. People aren't going to travel all the way out there to go to a casino, especially if there are, there's other Indian casinos probably closer to most people. So then they don't have that option. Uh, so they have terrible poverty. But in the tribes that have been able to use that, that has helped them considerably. Now, in the, the, Cherokee, uh, uh, the Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma, and I know the Cherokee Band, the Eastern Cherokee Band in North Carolina, they're, uh, tri they're enrolled tribal members have a stake uh, in, in that tribal that tribal money. I used to work with a guy um, in, uh, in Crossville that was uh, enrolled, an enrolled member, and he had a lot of health issues. And once a month, I would drive him to Cherokee, North Carolina, because he could go there, pick up his medicine for free. Because that's where that, what that money was going to, hospitals, stuff like that. Now, you always hear about also corruption. I think when you've got money going on, there's going to be uh, some corruption. But I think that that may be overemphasized. <clears throat> and I think that a lot of it is just, I don't know about, about you guys, but I have frequently just heard people talking about Indians in casinos and being mad about it. Mad that they have them. It's like, it's okay to have Indians as long as they're completely unchanged from 200 years ago. As right, long as they're beating us at our own game. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And that goes back to what I was saying. I think I was saying it in our class about space and time. Did I, did I talk about that? Uh, that how people view Indians, how Americans have viewed Indians has depended on proximity in space and time. Yeah. yeah so if they're right there with you at the same time competing for the same resources, and that includes money. And most times the people around them are going to be very prejudiced to have very negative views. And there's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, a, a lot of um, ill treatment of them. It's only once they're gone or so few that they don't make a big difference they become romanticized. And now all of a sudden, oh, they were noble and glorious and wonderful. Let's name our team after them because they were so awesome. But they just weren't quite as good as we were. 
yeah. see how that works. You know, yeah. if you can't really look at that at them that way while you're taking their stuff away, because that makes you look really bad. And that's why you don't have that kind of romanticization of the other group of people who were not used for their land, but used for their labor, the African slaves. There is not any glorifying romanticizing uh, in the colonial period or the early period, or even now, when it comes to sports and entertainment, not unlike 200 years ago with the minstrel shows, but always blackness is treated as the other in the way this country is set up in a way that's not malleable the way redness is, if that makes sense. So the redness, it can depend a little bit on circumstances. Sometimes they're kind of glorified, but there's no way, there is no way that you can spin a story that you have kidnapped these people and impressed them into slavery forcibly, and they were awesome people because that makes you look bad. So the way that Southerners defended that in the early 1800s was by this paternalism, right? Where they're saying, you know, actually we're helping them out you know, getting them out of the jungle and they're not capable of taking care of themselves, you know, and so it's our Christian duty, and blah, 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 right? And boy, they really love us, uh, which, you know, that wasn't necessarily true. Um, and that's kind of carried over. That carries over into basically what I, I know I was talking about this, about the difference between how retroactively popular memory and popular history treat aim compared to the Black Panthers. You know? Um, it is so frustrating to me. I mean, I don't want to... I've made people mad in, in some cases by talking about specific documentaries or things, so I won't do that. But I have seen many uh, that were not as... Uh, as well done as the one on the Young Patriots. I've seen many things about the Black Panthers that focus, that purport to be historical and focus on incidents, but it all could be framed in that thing we were talking about earlier about how that, you know, basically that hacking of the public image without talking about fundamental things like, you know, the, the values that, that they had, the social programs, or even, I think more fundamentally, the fact that they were Marxist radicals. That never gets mentioned. And the fact that it was really a lot about class, right? I mean, when you see those guys, you see Bobby Lee coming over there talking to you guys, uh, they're making that point. We're all getting treated the same way. They're trying to divide us. And that's not the message that we get. I mean, everybody unless they've really looked into it when they hear about the black panthers we reggie you said you were educated most people are like that they just have this image it was just a bunch of quote unquote thugs i mean if you yeah. start they were carrying long guns in california where it was legal to do that and there's people doing that right now they're just not black you know i mean when they were doing that in the 60s governor of california um changed the law and restricted firearms uh, uh, public carry. And that was, that was Ronald Reagan. Um, Surprise. But, um, yeah. So, so people look back now on, on aim as they should, as they should for, you know, being right there in the middle of things and, and, and accomplishing a lot. But the, the Black Panthers did the same thing, you know, but it's not presented that way. And I feel like that's because as Americans, we have this desire to glorify the American Indian and identify with them and then gradually sort of co-opt that identity onto ourselves to show how American we are. But to other African Americans, uh, because just fundamentally the way our country grew, that's what it was built on. And it's like you got a dent in the cake pan Every cake you make is going to have that dent in it, you know, until somebody takes a hammer and beats that dent out. That's what it takes. I mean, just saying, man, I hate dents in my cake. So my friends and all have decided we're just not going to talk about it or look at the dent. That doesn't solve anything. 
anyway, so uh, a lot of my work, I teach a lot of classes on uh, American Indians. A lot of my work is about race in America and how that concept was created. And you know, it gets more complicated as American history went on. Like 19th century, you have different waves of immigrants that all had to figure out where they were. By the way, when we were talking earlier about the uh, Chicago 7 movie, I wanted to mention something that I've been watching is the new season of Fargo. Have you guys yes. watched Fargo? Have you yes, been watching the new season? Uh-huh. With Chris Rock? Yeah. That Excellent. is the story of America right there. Right, yeah. All of these yeah. different ethnic groups trying to prove they're better than black people, essentially, so they'll be accepted as American. Yeah. That, that's American history right there. I hope yeah. Chris Rock is an Emmy nomination for that. I do, too. It's, I, different for him, but it is, it is an excellent uh, series, and I would recommend it to anybody. It's really good. So, you know, President Trump and his administration have been talking about critical race theory and how evil that is. <clears throat> so that's part of my theoretical background. Although most people don't realize critical uh, race theory is race actually theory. legal history. It's a study of the law and the formation of race. The cultural version is called whiteness studies. And um, that's, that was my theoretical approach in my dissertation. And this show sums it up. The Fargo, yeah. it sums it up. Yeah. That you prove the immigrant groups and ethnic groups have to prove that they're worthy of being white. By as W. E. B. Du Bois said, by as soon as they get off the boat, starting to hate black people. And James Baldwin said the same thing. So yeah. That's just how yeah. our country was structured. That's why. That's why. And I'm. I know. I'm. I, I feel. Uh, uh, I feel like it's almost inappropriate for me to be talking about stuff like this with, with high here because he lived it and I've only read about it, but that's why Fred Hampton and you guys were so dangerous. That's why you had to be squashed because you were showing that narrative isn't true. That narrative is imposed. And that goes back to Bacon's rebellion. I I probably ran out of time. Got to throw this in there. Bacon's Rebellion, 1676. I consider that one of the five most important events in American history, maybe one of the top three. And most people have heard of it, but don't know much about it. Essentially, that was in the Virginia colony. And, you know, they've been having uh, indentured servants coming over to do the labor from England, poor people. And at the end of their seven-year contract, they would become free except most of them didn't live that long because of the disease and, you know, fighting Indians and all that stuff, except 50 or 60 years into the colony, they were starting to live to the end of their contract. And there was a bunch of them starting to accumulate, but there was no more land to give them because the plantation owners had taken it all. They'd also started using African slaves and they started using Indian slaves, American Indian slaves. Uh, But what happened was all these, poor white people who didn't get the land they were promised banded together with the free black people and a bunch of runaway slaves and essentially almost overthrew the colony. Uh, Eventually they were defeated. But after that, all of a sudden in the Virginia colony, they started passing all these laws that prevented black people and white people from fraternizing, made interracial marriage illegal, um, and restricted the rights of free black people. More rights taken away, more rights taken away that the poor white people still had. So it would introduce the idea to the poor white people, we're better than them. And there was that division, right? To control the workers. Yeah. And it's like, uh, if you've ever heard the, uh, uh, the illustration of the cookies. It's like you got a, a table and there's yeah. a plate with 10 cookies on it, right? Yeah. And so there's a, there's what, one rich white guy with eight cookies and then there's a poor white guy with one cookie and there's a black guy with one cookie and how colonial America worked and how America still works is the guy with eight cookies says to the white guy, 
watch that black guy. I think he wants to steal your cookie. And then they're at each other and he gets all the cookies. Right. Yeah. That's how it's always worked. That's how it's still, they play that game every day. And whenever like there's any hint of another Bacon's rebellion, uh, then something is, they step in. Right. So uh, the 1890s, the populist movement, when the populists uh, as a third party were coming down into the South and telling white farmers and black farmers, you need to band together because racism is just a trick to control you. That was the 1890s. When did Jim Crow start? When was Plessy versus Ferguson that made segregation legal? That was the early 1890s. It's not a coincidence. Yep. So, right. I guess I, I started, sometimes I forget, I, I forget I'm teaching history and start preaching history. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> it all ties in together. Amen, brother. Oh, yeah. <laughs> down, brother. That's, that's, that's an idea that Howard Zinn brought up, brought up, you yeah. know, in his yeah. uh, people's history. He, he suggested that uh, racism was uh, instituted by by the landed gentry to drive a wedge between their indentured servants and their, yeah. their black slaves. Yeah, and at the same time, they were doing the same things to drive wedges between the slaves and the American Indians to keep them from joining together. We, yeah. We've discussed Bacon's Rebellion down here, um, but it's been a kind of a romanticized version of it, talking about the... the uh, the different races uniting there, but yeah. what we never talk about is the reason they were uniting yes, to steal a land yes, from the Indians. So they, there's a dark side to this exactly. story. That's why I consider that the ultimate American story. It was poor white people and poor black, <laughs> black people joining together to disrupt the status quo, but it's because they wanted to kill Indians and take their land. Yeah. Um, are you familiar with, or with the automotive free clinic? Have you ever, just has that ever come across your radar? Just through this group. Um, I just dropped a, a link to their Facebook page. I'm, a, I'm active with them uh, in the chat here. Um, okay. And, and the, uh, the other thing is, is that uh, we've, we've got this online magazine called Populist Mechanics that oh, has God. an article that we all kind of colluded on to work on about uh, redefining redneck identity uh, in an in a effort to do fascist and racist deprogramming. Yes. Um, and it sounds like this is the, exactly the sort of stuff you would have been interested in when you were doing your dissertation. I'm trying to find the Populist Mechanics, so I can put a link to that. It's populistmechanics.com. Uh, and you, you, if you have a minute and you're interested, you might want to check that out. So if you, I can't remember the title of the article right now, but it's basically about uh, it's it's how the redneck culture has actually become uh an uh, internalized colony, like a, an orientalized part yes. of our society, uh, and it's it's <laughs> it's a different way of looking at things from what most of us are familiar with around here, uh, mm-hmm. and something that I think was will it could lead in a direction that we were talking about earlier of creating a sense of community. Uh, because most of the people that have come to the South to organize are like you're talking about. They're going to come down here, and in five minutes, they understand everything I want to tell us how to fix all our problems, yeah. and they wind up going home in a year or two pissed off because they couldn't do anything. Uh, but anyway, uh, this, this it's interesting how this stuff all seems to be tying together for me here. Uh, so... Uh, anyway, the more, that's, the more that the more people tie it together, and the more they talk about it, the more it will become in the public consciousness, the better. Well, we're trying to do our part, man. 
I will look. I, I will look uh, at those uh, sites. Sure. If I'm going to find Populous Mechanics here, but that's pretty easy to find. Yeah, there's a link to the Populous Mechanics Facebook page on that uh, on, on the Automotive Free Clinic page that you. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Good. Thank you, Tom. I'm yeah, not real swift kind of stuff, internet right? stuff. <laughs> Talked about it needs to be happening. So, you know. We talked on the on the phone about some of the stuff we might talk about today, and one of them was like why I'm interested in American Indian stuff. But it's actually I'm interested in race and class in America stuff, and the defining moment for that. I didn't realize it for a long time until I was in grad school, and uh, one of my professors uh, gave us an assignment. When was the first time that you were truly impacted by the fact there is such a thing as race in America? And so I had to think back. And I remembered in 1980, when I was 12 years old, on 60 Minutes, they had a thing about it was the 25th anniversary of the death of Emmett Till. And so I was 12 years old, and I saw that. And they showed the famous picture of the open casket. And his mother, I think, was still alive at that time. And, you know, she was crying. I was just so incredibly moved by, by that and by the injustice of it. And it just so happened that was around the time that I was starting to understand that I was a poor white person. Because in elementary school, I didn't know it. But when you get to middle school, it starts getting pointed out to you because people start self-segregating, right? And so... I started to feel that that sense of, of injustice toward me that all of a sudden, because of who I was and who my family was, these people who had been my, you know, some of them had been my friends, didn't talk to me anymore. And then I served, I just somehow, even as a kid, I made that connection that that's all the same kind of thing. And so I've spent a lot of my life since I've, I realized now, since I was a teenager, basically, just being concerned with injustice where people are concerned and particularly being a poor white Appalachian uh, and then living in other parts of the country, you know, uh, I have seen how that too, like you said, an internal colony. It's also, it's like, a, it's the lowest form of white person that maybe is not even entirely still white in this country. And it is all connected together. And there needs to be solidarity across the aisle and across the races on that basis. You got that right. All right. I'm all worked up now. Oh, good. We did our job. I'm so hot. I'm not <laughs> melt that ice cream. <laughs> all right. Well, I look forward to, to more discussions on this. I hope we can get you into our group somehow. There is, um, I have a blog that's called Tennessee Wordsmith, T-N Wordsmith, where I have written about a lot of these things. Um, I don't, I don't write on it as often as I used to because I've been really busy, but um, yeah, you can scroll back through there and a lot of this stuff and other things I've, I've talked about quite a bit. Um, T-N Wordsmith. Um, dot blogspot.com Yeah, I guess I could have just uh, typed it in there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that uh, I probably ought to get going. But man, I've enjoyed this. Yeah, man, this has been great. Very interesting. And I knew I didn't need to. I didn't need to prepare anything. I told Hi, you'll probably have a hard time shutting me up. <laughs> well, I wish we didn't run out of time, but I got to eat supper and get ready to go pick my daughter up from work. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, we'll have to talk more. And then next week, I'm really looking forward to having uh, yeah. friends, uh, uh, my friends over in uh, Sayota and, and, uh, and Jeff and Melba. All right. Well, 
I guess I will. Uh, um, what was it that they said uh, on uh, on Reservoir Dogs? All right, Ramblers, let's ramble. <laughs> See y'all. Later. Thank, thanks to all of y'all. Good night. Thank y'all for having me. See you later. Yep. Take care. Fireside Chats is a production of North Alabama School for Organizers. NASO seeks to empower communities through intersectional education and training. More information, including upcoming classes, at naso.network. Thank you for joining us for Fireside Chats.